Ronsard's sonnet was translated into German by Hans Suwarski, a student of both Krauss and Strauss, 
And this rough English translation comes from the Met performance with interpolations from a few others, including the lyric operas last night, the Capriccio song. No other stirs such passion in me. No fair one, no one on this earth. No other fills me with such longing. Not even Venus rivals you in this. Your eyes speak delight and woe. And if a glance may cause me pain, another will elicit joy again. They grant me life or else death. And if I live 500,000 years, except for you, wonderful one, none may claim my heart. In new veins, my blood would have to course. And since it is already overflowing, no room remains there for any other love. So please join me now in welcoming Renee Fleming and Mark Strand. trivia. Uh, uh, I, this was my offering at my friend actress Laura Linney's wedding, was uh, to read this poem. Uh, and um, yes, yes. I'm amazed. Thank you. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, before we begin, I just want to read it to you. This is just the second, uh, the second of the three. Um, so we'll start with this brief reading. And now, while the advocates of awfulness and sorrow push their dripping barge up and down the beach. Let's eat our brill and sit this beautiful white bone. True, the light is artificial and we are not well dressed. So what? We like it here. We like the bullocks in the field next door. We like the sound of wind passing over grass. The way you speak in that low voice our late night disclosures. Why live for anything else? Our masterpiece is the private life. And before we get to Capriccio, I want to talk about uh, a collaboration, a major collaboration that we recently enjoyed. Alan Gilbert, the music director for the New York Philharmonic, approached me about a commission with Swedish composer Anders Hilborg. After a post-concert dinner in Stockholm, which is, I think, where most projects are born. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> uh, so, the art song, it's a little bit confusing because if we go way back in history, we have storytellers, we have troubadours, we have sacred songs. Uh, the art song sort of became uh, this combination of of poetry and music, and a composer's contribution uh, found its, its heyday, really, in, with, with the music of Franz Schubert in the beginning of the 19th century, yeah. and, um, and the advent of great romantic poetry as well. Exactly. Uh, and it's continued on. It's something I adore. If you don't get to see a recital once a year, you should really try. Um, in fact, uh, Lyric is offering Beyond the Aria soon, and Craig is here, he can tell you a little bit more about it if you stop him. <laughs> but one of the, the best recitals I remember was Bo Scobos uh, at Symphony Center here a hundred years ago. So it's a special delight, this marriage of music and poetry, which we will talk about. Um, so we had this, this idea uh, to um, create this work, which could have been a monologue, it could have been a number of things. I even um, spoke with Stephen Colbert briefly about uh, a text of his. 
And I always had Mark in mind uh, and, and had hoped to convince Anders uh, of, for using his poetry. And of course, he had, he had Swedish poets in mind. We had all kinds of suggestions. This is a long process. I, I went back through it in preparation for this and discovered that I had 1,300 documents on my computer and I'm just a singer. <laughs> so it's quite an extraordinary uh, process for putting this together. Um, so Mark sent us books of poetry. Yeah. I was in Paris and Anders was in Stockholm and also in the south of France. Well, I mean, if you were, I mean, well, we have a mutual friend, Maria Schneider. Yes. Met you in Paris and said, I uh, just sent some of Mark's translations of the Brazilian poet Carlos Drummond. And you, I think you said, I wasn't there, of course, but I think you said to Maria, gee, I, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, sing some of yeah. settings of Strand. I said I'd love to meet him. As far as oh, yeah. you know, so, yeah. so she passed on your email address, and that's how it all started. But um, I don't think this is on. <laughs> is it on? Yeah. yeah. No. So, so we had this wonderful uh, potential for collaboration, and I was curious, what were you thinking? First of all, when you received this suggestion that we perhaps well, work together in this. Piece. First of all, I mean. I am one of your greatest fans, so I was ready to do anything. And he said, I'd like to watch Strand jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Strand would have jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. So uh, I thought, if we're going to do this, uh, I wasn't sure that our masterpiece is The Private Life, which is the poem that you like so much, and it's a poem that I like. Uh, would be a singable poem, but I thought that I would send you each copies of my book so that you could choose. And then I also selected certain poems uh, that I thought were embedded in the romantic tradition and might be uh, uh, set. And uh, uh -huh. we're easily. Uh -huh. Well, I wasn't sure because well, you could mark were, them. You could actually mark them yeah, as books. They were easily. Well, first of all, they're uh, easily understood <laughs> on first reading. Maybe not understood in their entirety, but there's a level on which they can be uh, assimilated. Uh, and the other is simply. Uh, I like them. <laughs> That's good. Um, we'll, we'll take that. And if you had, you've had your, your poetry set to music before. I have, and there is a problem. Uh, not With Anders, it was fantastic, because uh, the problem I usually have with settings of my poems is the poems are lost. Uh, music takes over, and the poem is sort of fodder for the musical mill. Uh, you don't, uh, it could have been my poems, it could have been Joe Blow's poems. Uh, there was no sense that A, poetry has its own musical character. Poets, at least up until very recently, uh, paid attention to meter, cadence, uh, the sound that their poem uh, was making. And these uh, rhyme and meter became ways uh, of not only establishing a cadence that was pleasant, but also of remembering the poems. They're mnemonic devices. Uh, Joseph Brodsky used to say, you poor American poets who write in free verse, your poems will never be remembered. <laughs> Sir Andrew actually pointed out to me the other night that the the um, sonnet that we'll hear later on is in is actually in five bar phrases, which is not which is irregular. 
and I'm sure that was on purpose to go with the verse, but this I love. Um, right after the first hearing of the sonnet set to music uh, in Capriccio, which is a sort of halfway through the first act, Olivier, the poet, who really didn't want this in the first place, he was very anxious about it, said, I knew it, he wrecks my verse, the precious balance is wholly lost, the rhymes are destroyed, the sentences dismembered, arbitrarily dissected into short and long-held musical noises. They call them phrases, the honored musicians. Who can hear the slightest sense of the text? The flattering music is bound to triumph. Lucky man, my words are like a ladder, the more easily to reach his victory, meaning the composer. <laughs> Very well said. Well, I mean, that is not always the case. Yes. Certainly not with the strand settings. And, uh, but by and large, uh, I mean, <coughs> the words are lost. And, uh, and I can't bear to listen to the. <laughs> it's interesting because the, uh, the play that I was in this summer was the first experience for me of saying words without music. And there was, on the one hand, this tremendous freedom. So I could make up my own tempo. I could stop in the middle of a sentence if I felt like it. Mm -hmm. I could reflect. So, it, it, and every night I could do it differently. Because truly when a composer uh, sets music to words, he is also putting a massive, he or she is putting a massive stamp on it. Um, creating tempo, creating expression, creating where the high point of the phrase is gonna be musically speaking. Yeah. Well, there's also, uh, one of the interesting things about a collaboration, if it is one, is you have two identities uh, joining to make a third identity. And uh, if you're not on the same page, so to speak, uh, you can create a disaster. Uh, when, you, when you write a poem, it's your poem. It's your world that you have it's your own verbal world that you've created. And when a composer composes music, it's his musical world that he's created. And, uh, you know, people are different. And unless, I think what has to happen in a collaboration is the composer, the composer gives in a little, mm -hmm. the poet gives in a little, because you're making a third thing. And you can't expect a total fidelity to your work because that means, say, the composer's identity is terribly compromised. Did you hear this in the process along the way or did you only hear it when it was finished? I only heard it when it was finished. Ah, uh, okay. So we premiered this in Carnegie Hall actually on April 16th uh, last year and and Mark joined us on stage uh, because it, there's no question in this piece that the, the text is uh, equal to the music and, and equally important. Shall we, shall we hear a little bit of it? Will Let's you hear, read? yeah, because it, I, I will say this. It was one of the greatest evenings of my life. Not just because my words were honored, but to uh, be on stage with Renee and Anders and uh, Alan Gilbert and have all these people stand up, a couple thousand people clapping. I mean, a poet in America today doesn't get that. <laughs> 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 I mean, sure it's fun. I sit there like a, a rabbit frozen in the headlines. <laughs> No, it was really exciting, and I just sang it again. Uh, this was the um, the first concert for the Minnesota Symphony that had uh, been in a lockout situation for 18 months. It was a highly emotional, highly powerful event, and very exciting to present the piece again. The Strand setting, I even love the title. Um, so, will you read uh, the sure. Sinister Angels? These are so. These ultimately, Anders chose. He made the final decision on these, um, and we worked back and forth, uh, uh, and it was a thrill for me and an honor for me to be uh, even included in this process, but um, selections from Manny Camel and Dark Harbor. The Sickness of Angels. I know I wrote it, but I don't remember. <laughs> you want to read it? I have it right here, right here. <laughs> 
So I think we're playing this song, which is quite short, which is also quite fascinating because there's a jazz bass. This music is, is um, Anders' music I would describe as, as, as creating this tremendously almost futuristic sounding landscape uh, in, in much of what he writes that's, that's complex but accessible at the same time and very modern sounding. This piece, however, is quite uh, intense. Yeah, this was a little different from the others. It yes, to me, uh, yeah. Uh, not quite in the same romantic. No, this is uh, quite quite intense is the word. And then, mm -hmm. and then we'll play, I think, some of the, the final song as well, which is um, Dark Harbor. Yeah. Okay. Well, this, uh, this is Dark Harbor 35. The sickness of angels is nothing new. I've seen them crawling like bees, flightless, chewing their tongues, not singing, down by the bus terminal, hanging out, showing their legs, hiding their wings, carrying on for their brief term on earth, no longer smiling, asleep in the shade of each other, they drift into the arms of strangers who step into their light, which is the mascara of Eden, offering more than invisible love, intangible comforts, offering the taste, the pure erotic glory of death without echoes, the feel of kisses blown out of heaven, melting the moment they land. And uh, this is another uh, poem from Dark Harbor, Dark Harbor 11. A long time has passed, and yet it seems like yesterday, in the midmost moment of summer, when we felt the disappearance of sorrow and saw beyond the rough stone walls the flesh of clouds, heavy with the scent of the southern desert, rise in a prodigal overflowing of mildness. It seems like yesterday when we stood by the iron gate in the center of town while the pollen-filled breath of the wind drew the shadow of the clouds around us so that we could feel the force of our freedom while still the captives of dark. And later, when the rain fell and flooded the streets and we heard the dripping on the porch and the wind rustling the leaves like paper, how to explain our happiness then, the particular way our voices erased all signs of the sorrow that had been, its violence, its terrible omens of the end. So, so now we're going to hear the
that's an excerpt from that. Let's turn the mics off and see if we can turn the volume up. Cheers, Okay, try now. So, you will, uh, there's a plan to record the piece, so you'll get to hear it someday. <laughs> hard to hear. Yes, I know, it's very hard to hear, and I know it. Um, so, you're a visual artist, too. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is sure. this a recent development? No, I went to art school uh, early on, and uh, when I went to, I went to Yale to study with Joseph Albers. And uh, when I got there, I realized that there were a lot of other people who had a lot more talent than I had, and thought maybe I was in the wrong place. So I started taking English courses. <laughs> and uh, that seemed to work out better, although I, I actually wasn't quite as bad as I'm being now.
properties of art carried over into the writing of poems. And so I made it my business to investigate, as well as I could on my own, uh, the resources that I would need as a poet, which meant scanning endless verses, uh, looking closely at different kinds of poems, trying to figure out the rationale between, uh, say, picking, writing four or six line stanzas instead of six four line stanzas. The idea of shaping a poem, uh, making my poems sound like they were written by a real poet and not, a, not a, an exile from painting. <laughs> and, uh, and then I. Then amnesia set in. I think I woke up when I was 40 and realized there's nothing else I can do. I've been writing poetry. I can't get a job as a waiter anymore. <laughs> I was a waiter when I was at Yale. I worked at tables down at Maury's. I worked at the old Heidelberg. I, was, uh, I think the English department took pity on me. Uh, I worked so hard. I was artistic. I. Uh, I needed help, so I became a bartender at their functions and would get drunk at every one of them. <laughs> uh, the, uh, and then, you know, uh, but I always, you know, I had friends who were painters and I loved talking with them about art. And I would go to museums, any city I went to, I would go to the museum and look around and I wrote little articles. Uh, in fact, I became the uh, art critic for Vogue magazine for five years. People didn't think it was the same Mark Strand. Uh, okay. I did that for a while, and and then I uh, I wrote a little book on Edward Hopper, and I wrote a little I wrote catalogs for painter friends of mine, and and then I decided to fool around with collage making and, and drawing. Uh, here in Chicago, I uh, had a lot of time. I didn't know many people. I was either preparing for my classes at the Committee on Social Thought. I lived alone in this apartment, so I would listen to music. I'd take out a drawing board and draw. As, a re as an escape from reading Kant or Hegel <laughs> or whoever I had to teach uh, that day. And, uh, and then I sort of made little collages. And, uh, and then I, when I moved to New York, I uh, met a woman who was the founder of Dear Today, a nonprofit organization that does artist books and supplies paper for artists. And I, uh, they wanted me to see a book that had been made of one of my poems. And I said, sure, uh, I'll come down and take a look. And I thought, this art, I can do that. <laughs> well, uh, that was the perfect thing to say because she said, you could? <laughs> I, I said, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I was an art student. You were. Yes, I studied with Albers. You did. <laughs> Why don't you try coming down and making paper and maybe we can do something together. So I did and I became fascinated. Uh, and that, that was the beginning of collage making. And to this day, I still make my own paper there by Sue Gosen, who devotes hours and hours to working with me, just freely. And, uh, and I make these papers with the idea that they will be torn or cut up and become collages. I didn't want to make collages that fell into the tradition the main line of collage making, which is the Max Ernst, uh, Hannah Hochrell, Hausman, uh, 
tradition uh, here in America, to a certain extent, Joseph Cornell, or the, uh, the kind of Cubist collage that Kurt Schwitters did, I wanted to do something else, and making my own papers was the, was the one way of being, I suppose, original. And uh, I, I'm in love with doing it. It's, for me, at 80, I feel I'm in kindergarten again, cutting and tearing pieces of paper, pasting them down, <laughs> seeing how they look. And I, I will say this about writing in relation to all of this, is that I'd written my whole life, and I finally, there's a point at which you run out of gas, and maybe that's the time to retire. Although when a writer says he's retiring, like Philip Roth and Alice Munro did, to great uh, notoriety. When a poet does it, it's not news at all. <laughs> Maybe more of them should retire. Uh, I, you know, I just said, you know, doctors retire, lawyers retire, everybody's retired, but a writer isn't allowed to retire. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Uh, so I retired and uh, writing, and uh, I think the concentration on the visual arts meant that I was escaping the kind of meaning that was demanded, verbal meaning, that exerts so much pressure day after day, uh, fiddling over lines, you know, whether to use the definite article here or the indefinite article, this sort of thing that will wake you up in the middle of the night. You know, it just drove me nuts. So I turned to the visual arts where making visual sense is an entirely other proposition. You're not thinking verbally. You're not saying, now I'm going to pick green. And green because. No. Green looks good. <laughs> fine over here. You know, that's different. I mean, what a relief. <laughs> that's the story of my career. <laughs> yeah, but I wonder if you I, I, but I wonder if you feel that way because you're coming to it now as a second focus as opposed to the primary focus. I mean maybe when you if you were starting out in, in art you'd feel very differently about the process. But but back to words and music. So Capriccio really sets out um, did, any, did any of you see the opera last night? Oh, good, wonderful. Are any of you planning on seeing the opera? Oh, good, I hope all of you would raise your hands. There are only six more performances, I think. It's a short run. Yeah, it's a short run. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a very special piece, so probably will be done here again for a long time because it's based on this phenomenal discussion um, that all of the characters have in an ongoing manner throughout the piece, which yeah. is, it's not just words versus music, which, which do you find more expressive, more compelling, which is more important, right. but it's also um, the two men who, who represent the composer and the, and, the, and the writer are trying to win the infection of the, uh, the countess, and she has to make a decision. Yeah. So, and it's very much left up in the air. Well, I hope the music or the poetry will uh, sway Madeline, you know, that she'll make a choice between the two. Uh, it's not really a choice between so many other things that these men may possess. <laughs> right, right. You know, that doesn't really, yeah, all things being equal, I think, is what we were supposed to uh, imagine. <laughs> They're really interchangeable, except for what they do. <laughs> but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous album. Yeah, it is beautiful. And of course, the, the showcase piece is the final 20-minute aria. And um, in case you're all wondering why I'm here, because uh, I don't really have anything to do uh, directly with being a creator, being a composer, or a writer, but the interpreter is the one who brings it to life in the case of, of music. Um, you know, in your case, it's the reader uh, or the viewer. So this, and this combining of senses, I think, is something that we all find now very interesting. We're in such a digital world. We're in a world that 
um, without armchair listeners anymore. People are, are by and large absorbing massive amount of, of information now more than ever in our lives exactly. and, or in any lifetime. So uh, this combination of words and music, I mean, do you have any strong feelings about it? And do you, what, I have to ask you this, what do you listen to when you're working? Well, I don't listen to anything. When I was writing poetry, I couldn't because I had the tune of my own language that I was concentrating on. Was the music of your language a key element? A key. I don't think it exists anymore with a lot of poetry. I think the visual character of the poem, the way it's set up on the page, and these little uh, clusters of words, there's a kind of... Uh, the kind of continuity that I try to establish uh, in my poems, a seamless uh, development of a poem, say moving from melancholy to humor, or from humor to melancholy. Uh, I don't think that exists now. Um, I think there's a kind of, uh, well, a discontinuity and a, a desire to sort of take the reader by surprise, or uh, create uh, a series of non sequiturs that uh, is exciting and uh, perhaps evocative, but uh, very often I, a reader of poetry all my whole life, don't know what's going on. Uh, so I'm, to be honest, at a loss with a lot of the poetry I read now. Uh, but uh, the music that I, when I wrote prose, I would listen to music. And it was usually uh, orchestral, a music that would urge me on. I mean, the kind of monothematic, so about Tchaikovsky or Delius Dil or that sort of thing, you know. But I would, I would never listen to uh, anyone singing. Uh, it had to be uh, something that pushed me forward. Uh, but I have a large collection of women singing, <laughs> and you're the major portion of that. I probably uh, gave those CDs to him. So. <laughs> no, no, I had, I had, no, you gave me some, but I had plenty before that. And uh, I, uh, you know, when I would sit and draw, I'd listen, and uh, when I would just sit, I would listen. Sit and listen. And uh, sit and do nothing but listen. And it was a deep, deep pleasure. Um, so, but the mixing of, it's, I couldn't, uh, writing poetry, I couldn't listen to anything. Um, impossible. Making what, makes, uh, what makes your poetry, so for one thing, I, I will say this, one of the reasons why I really wanted to sing your work is for exactly what you just described, I'm so happy you said that, is that it's, I, I, you can get something from it, from every poem, you can get something immediately from it. And then it's the richness and the evocative quality makes you want to go back and delve deeper. And there are, there are a lot of poems where you think, yeah, I can set that, but the audience is it's going to wash right over. Yeah. They won't get anything out of it. What is it that makes your work uh, musical in a way? Well, I, I, I really, I don't know, except that I pay attention to the sound of words. And, uh, you know, I don't, uh, it's alliteration, it's, uh, uh, assonance, it's these various tools that we use to create uh, pleasing sound. But it's a journey to each piece, as you said, going through humor and then through some epic evocative, also uh, uh, very often uh, a, a sense of yearning, longing. Well, I, I mean, I try for the deepest, richest, possible uh, work I can muster up, but I, I will say there is something that guides me. 
I want the reader to be surprised and yet to feel that the surprise was inevitable. I wanted to create the inevitability of surprise so that it had to be this way. So it's not arbitrary, it doesn't seem arbitrary. Like, yeah, I mean, oh, it's great. odd, it's different, it takes you back, but there's no other, there's no other solution. There is no other sequitur that would work. How long does it take you to write a piece? Is, there, is it a very time-consuming, challenging process, or do some things just, you wake up one day and there it is? Well, there's my very short poem called Keeping Things Whole, which I wrote in 20 seconds in the middle of a card game. <laughs> and, and then there's uh, other poems which have taken me a couple of years, not every day plugging away at them, but going back to them, back to them. And early in my days as a writer, I would spend, I spent a whole year on a poem, which I later threw away, but it was so complicated formally that uh, it was doomed to fail. Uh, I would set uh, terrible uh, hurdles for myself. Uh, I don't know, I used to make up rhymes in class, uh, these feminine slam rhymes, Jesus and Jazzes, Hebrews, highbrows. You know, I wanted to make, and I did write a poem. There's an early, very early poem in my book, which is a, give entirely over to the sound of language and to music, um, called Sleeping With One Eye Open, where I have uh, rhymes that follow each other. Uh, unmoved by what the wind does, uh, unmoved by what the wind does, the windows are not rattled to the various areas of the house, make their usual racket, creak at the truss, truss creak at the joints, trusses and studs instead. So you get that kind of motion throughout the poem. And, uh, you know, that's what I paid attention to. And uh, in a different way, even when I wrote my last book, which is these prose poems, I was, uh, I certainly paid attention to the writing uh, and I wasn't dealing with line length, but I was dealing with shaping sentences that had uh, the same authority that uh, the lines of a, of a good poem have. Uh, so. It's interesting because the, the whole process, uh, you know, right now I could, I could ask you a hundred more questions. For instance, I always wonder how you know, the teaching of it, the, the, the instilling of information, of discipline, and of rigor without, uh, without having someone lose their original voice. Um, and for us, it's a really a layering process. So, for instance, I've sung this role now six or seven times, and uh, each time, and part of it is, is the power of inspiration. It's new colleagues, it's a new director, new conductor. Um, and, and sometimes it's just that you're different, your life is different, you're in a different place, emotionally speaking. Um, when I come to a role, vocally speaking, this is the, um, the most mysterious of instruments. It's run by mostly involuntary muscles. So we're talk about being at the mercy of your own mind and, and soul. Uh, so each time I come back to this role, I find depth, I find more layers, I find, um, for instance, this whole thing, um, with her uh, having the photograph of her, she's a widow. It says right in the beginning, you know, that she's a widow. But you never ever see or, or hear mention anything about her, her um, deceased husband. And so I said, can we have a photograph? Can we have this be part of the story that she, she has to let go of him? So this is the way that, this is our only creative outlet within an interpretation because everything is on the page for us. Including how fast or slow or loud or soft mm -hmm. the weeks in your phrase. Um, but within that, we can shape things. We can put our own personality, our own um, voice, of course. Well, that, I mean, that, then you become a creator. At to, yes, so I get a little bit, you know, that's, that's the art of the interpreter. That's the art of interpretation. And, and of course, I, like you, 
um, have been so inspired my whole life by going to museums, by going, by reading, by, by really being interested in all of the arts. Yeah. And when I was a child, uh, I uh, tried everything. I, I did a lot of crafts, stained glass, and macrame. This is the macrame time. <laughs> Rub Anybody else, right? Um, I wrote a play about the poor fifth grade fat girl, so I think it was a little bit autobiographical. And, uh, and I absolutely had this, I was so shy and I read books all the time. And this is where the inner life is developed that enables yeah. you to become an artist. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I dream, I was in the Art Institute and I said, that's it, I'm going to be a ceramicist, that's it. I'm just going to retire and become a ceramicist. So we do have these yeah. yearnings for doing something else, and you're doing it. Well, I'm doing it, yeah, uh, I'm lucky. You know, it's important to have something uh, to get up in the morning uh, for. And, I mean, you have to want to, you have to have a reason for continuing and making art, writing, you know, interpreting music, writing music, uh, these are all uh, very important, uh, not only for the individual artist, but for society as a whole. So uh, if I pick up the paper today and see the headlines that we're seeing right now, where there are five of them at least, where you think, oh my gosh, this is really catastrophic. What do we say to people about why what we do is important? Well, uh, we're not going to take care of the horrors that exist in the world by singing or writing poems or making collages. But what we, uh, what we can do is make sure that, and it doesn't happen overnight, uh, what we're responsible for is keeping the inner life alive. That uh, the history of human subjectivity is in our hands. It's in poetry and music and the visual arts that we recognize our humanness. Uh, and if we didn't have those models, I don't know what we would do. And if we didn't have those uh, arts, I think our inner lives would wither. Uh, we. Um, it's the way, you know, talking about language, I'm, uh, perhaps it won't sound this way, but I'm perhaps a little more adept at doing that. Um, I often think that we wouldn't have love unless we had the language of love. That this gives it a way and a depth, and, and the nuances that make love the adventure and the experience that it is. Otherwise, we'd be groaning, as I'm sure many people do who don't have the benefit of you know, the arts. Uh-huh, uh, I love you. <laughs> and it ends there. Well, I mean, that's something, but how much richer it is than <laughs> you have, you know, Shakespeare's sonnets that you can go to, or any number of Well, if I could be a spokesperson for music, too, um, the thing about Capriccio, when I first learned it, was uh, embedded in a, in, a, in a rather sophisticated way are the love stories of the characters, and, and they profess their love in these short vignette scenes. And I remember thinking, gosh, that's Strauss. I really wish I knew him. Wow, what a guy. I mean, because it's just so deep, the, the expression, exactly what you said. And music can take a text and, and allow it to be a cri de coeur, right? allow it to be something that is a full expression of, of the heart. Um, and that's why singing is so great, and that's why I love singing so much. Um, all over the world, every culture, they're singing. 
Yeah, I think we, we, we live in a world that is uh, constantly drawing us out of ourselves uh, and offering us uh, immediate gratification, quick fixes, explosive uh, thrills, you know. People say, it knocked me out. Blew me away. <laughs> All these expressions, which are uh, uh, violent uh, and uh, suggest a kind of uh, explosiveness that is not part of the character of, the, of you know investing one's uh, life with uh, beauty. Uh, sometimes it's, it's slow, sometimes it's more difficult, uh, but it's ultimately much more enriching if you travel inward instead of constantly being drawn out. outward. Mm -hmm. So you're first, talking about the assault you, of... Yeah, and you also find out more about who you are. Um, we are at the end of our time, and I think we have a wonderful performance. Jonathan, where are, where are you? And Maureen. Uh -huh, okay. So we're going to hear the sonnet. We're going to hear the power of the human voice, bringing words to life. Um, we thought to maybe ask you if you had an opinion about what you preferred, words or music, or what you thought was more immediate. Um, does anybody want to be courageous? If I say words, since we're at the Poetry Foundation, I suspect this will be the majority. If I say words, will you raise your hand if you think that's more immediate? And music? Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. Can we interview you and ask you why? That's very curious. That's very curious. Um, uh, so, that's very interesting. Are you surprised? No. I mean, I feel the same way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I take music maybe a little bit for granted. It's been a part of my life forever, and uh, I love it so deeply. So I'm sort of very impressed by all the other art uh, out there. Uh, the other arts do their thing too. Uh, it may not be as immediate. Uh, as music. I mean, That's you true. may not fall under the thrall of. Well, music is immediate, and it's also um, highly emotional. Yeah, but it's immediately seductive. I, I think that uh, it appeals to the senses in a way that uh, so immediately and so powerfully that poetry can, because we're dealing with language that's used every day, and we have to sort of separate the language that we use every day and make the transition to the language that's being used in a special way in this poem. And that takes a little bit of adjusting. And then what poetry communicates is not is not not reveal reveal immediately necessarily 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 part of it is the poetry is something that you can go back and back to and levels and levels are revealed. It's true of music, I'm sure, but uh, the magic of poetry is that we can use everyday language, and yet poets create an, uh, an identity that is separate from anything else. Wallace Stevens doesn't sound like anyone else. Robert Frost doesn't sound like anyone else, and they're using the same words we use every day. How do they do that? Same is true of classical composer, that recognizability, that immediate uh, uh, musical language that distinguishes uh, a composer within two bars. Strauss is a perfect example of that. Yeah. You're right. And the more you invest in it, the more you listen, the more you know, as with all things that are really worth knowing, uh, the more you get out of it. So uh, Jonathan Johnson and Maureen Zoltek are performing the sonnet is at the heart of the discussion between words and music and love of Olivier Flamand for Madeleine. Thank you so much. Do, 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 I urge you.
get this book, you will be richly rewarded. Thank you all for coming. To